Hey there, welcome back to Rock and Rollin', where we dive deep into the legendary tales of rock history. Today we're embarking on a rock and roll journey as we dive into the rich legacy of the legendary Rolling Stones and uncover the stories behind their top 10 greatest guitar riffs. Let's get started. I'm a the song is Monkey Man, 1969. An exhilarating ride from start to finish. Monkey Man from the Rolling Stones' 1969 album Let It Bleed, is a masterpiece of punchy rhythm, swaggering vocals, and of course, the memorable and infectious guitar riff. This riff, crafted by the legendary Keith Richards, is an electrifying mix of rhythm and lead guitar styles that catapults the song into the annals of rock and roll history. The gloomy funk of Monkey Man, written on the Amalfi Coast on the same 1969 vacation as Midnight Rambler and originally named Positano Grande, was immortalized in Scorsese's Goodfellas. It has one of Mick Jagger's most mysterious stream-of-consciousness lyrics, I'm a cold Italian pizza, I could use a lemon squeezer, and is constructed over one of the Stones' most underappreciated riffs. Keith Richards plays all the guitars, reaching deep into his arsenal of tricks to create the atmospheric C minor descent of the opening the triumphant slide solo, and the magnificent main riff, which takes a simple repeated chord figure and transforms it into a furious simian fist of funk, using every hammer-on, pull-off, walking bass note, and dissonant tone at his disposal. The opening piano line, played by Nicky Hopkins, sets an anticipatory tone before the track explodes into its full riff-driven glory. The guitar work is interlaced with a vibraphone, bringing a unique flavor to the sound. Did you know? The vibraphone played by Bill Wyman as well as the bass on the track. But it's the guitar riff pure Richards, that hooks listeners and drives the song forward, embodying the gritty, raw energy that the Rolling Stones were renowned for. Monkey Man was allegedly a playful jab at the band's own rock and roll lifestyle, a sort of self-deprecating humor embedded within a powerful rock anthem. The Stones were the Monkey Men, wild, unconventional, and pushing the boundaries both musically and socially. From a historical context, Monkey Man is a great example of the Stones' transition from their early bluesy style into harder rock. The song's riff is a musical statement, showcasing the band's evolving sound and Richard's unique approach to guitar playing. While Monkey Man may not have achieved the commercial success or mainstream recognition of some of the Stones' other tracks, it's a testament to their musical prowess and a highlight in their extensive catalog. It's a song that lets the guitar work shine, making it a favorite among fans of the Rolling Stones' raw, high-energy rock and roll. Street Fighting Man The Stones' first and only explicitly political song is one of the iconic compositions of the 1960s and a wonderful illustration of how imaginative the band could get while pursuing the ideas in their minds. In search of a garagey sound, Richards recorded his open D-tuned Gibson Hummingbird acoustic into a Phillips tape deck, alongside Charlie Watts playing a tiny practice drum kit. The song's instrumentation is entirely acoustic, with a second acoustic guitar section, piano, a shalani, a tambouri, and a sitar added later. Did you know? Street Fighting Man is one of Keith Richards' favorite Stone songs. It's the kind of record you love to make, and they don't come around that often. Tumbling Dice, hailing from their 1972 album 
Exile on Main Street. As with many of the Stones' tracks, the story behind its creation combines both musical experimentation and the lifestyles of the band members during that period. Tumbling Dice originally started as a song called Good Time Women. This early version was a bluesier take and somewhat different lyrically, but it laid the foundation for what would later become Tumbling Dice. The song's lyrics delve into the world of gambling, love, and uncertainty. Mick Jagger, who wrote the lyrics, drew inspiration from the gambling metaphors, particularly dice games. The term tumbling dice can be seen as a reflection of the unpredictability of life, love, and the inherent risks in both. Tumbling dice wasn't an easy song to record. The band reportedly had some difficulty nailing down a version they were satisfied with. They played it countless times, experimenting with different tempos and arrangements. Keith Richards, the mastermind behind many of the Rolling Stones' memorable riffs, was instrumental in shaping the song. The track has a rollicking, loose feel, emblematic of the entire Exile on Main Street album. The sound of the song was influenced by the environment in which it was recorded. The basement of Nelcote, Richard's villa in the south of France. The setting provided a unique atmosphere that added to the raw and spontaneous vibe of the recording sessions. Tumbling Dice actually started off life during the Sticky Fingers sessions, and its casual insouciance took four studios. Over 100 takes, two drum tracks, and possibly even two drummers to nail down. Charlie Watts, the band's drummer, mentioned in interviews how challenging it was for him to get the rhythm right, leading to Keith Richards stepping in to guide the rhythm section. But Keith Richards' opening riff, and the song's infinitely rolling twin guitar refrain in the outro, Open G, Capo on the fourth fret, you're going to be there for a while, ultimately make it all worth it. Did you know? Jagger also plays guitar on this track, with Mick Taylor playing bass. Today, it's not just celebrated for its catchy riff and lyrical depth, but also as a representation of the Rolling Stones at a particularly tumultuous and creatively fruitful period in their career. Despite the challenges during its recording, Tumbling Dice was chosen as the lead single from Exile on Main Street. The song became a massive hit, solidifying its place in rock history. The Rolling Stones' timeless classic, Honky Tonk Women. Honky Tonk Women is one of the signature tunes of the Rolling Stones, known for its memorable opening riff. The story behind the creation of this iconic riff and the song itself is quite interesting and full of unique elements of rock and roll history. The legend has it that the song was born during the band's trip to Brazil in early 1969. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, the leading creative forces of the Rolling Stones, were on vacation in Matau, Sao Paulo, taking a break from their chaotic life and seeking inspiration for their upcoming work. Keith Richards came up with the catchy, cowbell-infused riff while at the ranch. However, it wasn't honky-tonk bars and women that inspired it. In contrast to the song's lyrics, the surroundings were rural with wide open fields, horses, and a serene atmosphere. The setting offered a peaceful environment where creativity could flow undisturbed. The original concept for the song was quite different from what it ended up being. It was first conceived as an acoustic country song titled Country Honk. In this version, the lyrics painted a picture of a rural setting, complete with references to an old, gold-top guitar and a gin-soaked barroom queen in Memphis. However, when the band returned to London and started working in the studio, the song underwent a significant transformation. Inspired by the energy of the city and the vibrant music scene, 
the band decided to give the song an electric makeover. With the addition of the gritty amplified guitar riff, the honky-tonk beat, and Jagger's evocative vocals, the song morphed into honky-tonk women. The iconic cowbell in the song was a serendipitous addition. During the recording, producer Jimmy Miller jumped in and started playing the cowbell to count in the song, and it sounded so good that the band decided to keep it in the final mix. It ended up being one of the most memorable parts of the song. Did you know? Brian Jones's last sessions with the band were during the early stages of recording this song. Honky Tonk Women was released as a single in July 1969, around the same time as the tragic death of Brian Jones, the band's former member. The song was an instant success, reaching number one in the UK and the US. To this day, the cowbell clanging, guitar-heavy introduction to Honky Tonk Women remains one of the most instantly recognizable riffs in rock music. A true testament to the Rolling Stones' musical genius and lasting impact on popular music. And the Rolling Stones' iconic riff from their classic track, Midnight Rambler. The year was 1969. The Rolling Stones were navigating a significant shift in their band dynamics. Brian Jones had just left, and Mick Jagger and Keith Richards were solidifying their bond as the core of the group. It was during this transformative period that Midnight Rambler was born. Let It Bleed's epic, nearly seven-minute side B introduction, described to Keith Richards as a blues opera, basically, was composed by Jagger and Richards while on vacation in a sun-drenched Amalfi Coast hamlet in 1968, similar to Monkey Man. The guitar sections, entirely played by Richards on a hollow-body Matin EG 240, the title Midnight Rambler, and the song's lyrics were reportedly inspired by the notorious Boston Strangler Albert DeSalvo, a dark theme that the gritty, bluesy riff effectively supports. Richard spent several hours refining this performance, ultimately offering the ideal, sinuous counter to Jagger's mournful harmonica playing in standard tuning with a capo on the seventh fret. The riff, a foot-stomping, blues-infused combination of notes, captures the dark and moody essence of the song. It is probable that Keith Richards devised the riff in his characteristic open tuning style, using a mix of rhythm and lead guitar elements to create a layered, compelling sound. Richards often drew inspiration from the great blues musicians of the past, such as Muddy Waters and Chuck Berry, and Midnight Rambler showcases those influences. Did you know? Brian Jones' percussion on this song was one of his final contributions to the Stones, which Richards subsequently characterized as a last flare from the shipwreck. During this period... The band would often compose and rehearse in various locations. One can imagine Richard stumbling upon the riff during a late-night session, matching it with the song's dark, predatory lyrics and theme. The energy of the band, coupled with their raw, youthful enthusiasm, would have molded the song into the powerful track we know today. Despite not being released as a single, Midnight Rambler became one of the Rolling Stones' most iconic live tracks, with the potent riff becoming a staple of their performances. It remains a testament to the Stones' ability to blend rock and blues into a unique and compelling sound. So, the next time you listen to Midnight Rambler and find yourself swept up by its irresistible rhythm and energy, remember the context of its creation. It's not just a song, it's a piece of rock and roll history. Settlers. Okay.
Jumpin' Jack Flash is one of the Rolling Stones' most iconic songs, released in 1968. The story behind its signature guitar riff and its genesis is as emblematic as the song itself. The song's title and inspiration came from a real-life event involving Keith Richards, the band's lead guitarist. Keith was in his country house in Sussex, England, together with Mick Jagger, when they were woken up early one morning by a noise. It was the sound of Keith's gardener, named Jack, walking past the window in heavy boots. When Jagger asked what the noise was, Richards replied, Oh, that's Jack. That's Jumpin' Jack. This comment sparked something in the two of them. They were inspired to write a song around that theme and imagery. The gritty, earthy nature of the sound, of boots on gravel, of hard work in the outdoors, might have influenced the dirty, raw guitar riff that kicks off the song. Recorded using the same technique as for Street Fighting Man, recording acoustic guitars into a cassette deck to distort their sound. This May 1968 single is a shot of pure guitar innovation, but for such a direct and simple sounding riff, played on a Gibson Hummingbird acoustic tuned to open E and a second acoustic in Nashville tuning, it has many hidden depths and is often misunderstood. Yet if you only learn one Keith Richards lick, make it this. <laughs> Jumpin' Jack Flash became a quintessential Stones track, symbolizing their return to their rock and roll roots after their brief foray into psychedelia. The lyrics are somewhat abstract, with its allusions to cross-dressing and its imagery of being born in a crossfire hurricane. I was born in a crossfire hurricane. And raised by a toothless bearded hag. I was raised by a toothless bearded hag. Yet it's the story behind its inception and the driving riff that gives the song its timeless energy. Many consider Jumpin' Jack Flash to be one of the greatest rock and roll songs ever recorded, and the story behind its creation is a testament to how inspiration can come from the most unexpected places. Did you know? The Stones rearranged the song for live performance, and Richards now plays it in open G with a capo on the fourth fret. After all, in his 2010 autobiography Life, Richards said if he was told he could only play one of his riffs for the rest of his life, this is the one he'd choose. satisfaction. When people who don't play guitar draw a guitar, they draw a strat. Idiot! Those contours are all wrong. When people who don't play guitar mimic the sound of one, they hum this riff. That's how iconic Keith Richards' snarling signature. Famously a horn part he wrote and recorded in his sleep. It's not all about that Maestro FZ1 assisted riff, of course. Aside from Jagger stretching out with his lyrics, radio, props are also due to Bill Wyman's amazing but oft overlooked offbeat bass line. The simplicity of Brian Jones's acoustic and Keefe's verse licks over the propulsive beat and insistent tambourine. Altogether, a sound that expanded the horizons of pop music. Did you know? Jagger and Richards initially doubted the song would be a hit, but an in-band vote persuaded them to release it as a single. Paint It Black the Stones were beaten to the sitar and guitar combination by the Beatles on Norwegian Wood the year before, 
But the dark psychedelic flavor conjured up by Brian Jones's ominous noodling on this 1966 counterculture anthem has arguably proved just as influential. <laughs> The song owes a lot of its power to Charlie Watts's kinetic drums, combined with the bolero rhythms strummed on acoustic guitars. Though apparently, Keith was less enamored with his electric on the record. The electric guitar doesn't sound quite right to me, the one I play, he said in 1966. I should have used a different guitar, at least a different sound. Did you know? Bill Wyman played the B3 organ pedals on the track by laying on the ground and punching them with his fists. <laughs> Gimme Shelter has a theatrical backstory and rock and roll mythology to rival even Sympathy for the Devil in the Stone's rich catalog. Newsweek called it ecstatic, ironic, all-powerful, an erotic exorcism for a doomed decade. Gimme Shelter is one of the Rolling Stones' most iconic and enduring songs, both for its haunting melody and its poignant lyrics. And its famous opening riff. The late 1960s was a turbulent time marked by the Vietnam War, political unrest, and a series of shocking and violent events, including the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. It was during this period, specifically in 1969, that the Rolling Stones wrote Gimme Shelter. The song's apocalyptic tone and its lyrics about war, rape, and murder are a reflection of the turbulent atmosphere of the times. As Mick Jagger once commented, the song was written as a kind of end-of-the-world tune. It was the Stones' way of expressing their anxieties and fears about the chaotic world around them. Another defining element of Gimme Shelter is the powerful vocal performance by Mary Clayton. Jagger and Richards were searching for a powerful female voice to add to the chorus, and they invited Clayton, a seasoned backup singer, to join them in the studio late at night. Her chilling vocals, particularly her raw, emotional cries of rape, murder, gave the song an added layer of intensity. Her performance was so powerful that you can hear someone, believed to be Charlie Watts, exclaiming in the background of the track after one of her powerful verses. Over the years, Gimme Shelter has been hailed as one of the greatest rock songs ever recorded. Like Sympathy, before it, it took something special musically to cement its place as one of the greatest songs of all time. And this factor is Keith's immortal guitar intro. The legendary opening riff, which sets the haunting tone for the song, was crafted by Keith Richards. He was inspired to write it during a stormy night in London. Keith had been experimenting with an open tuning on his guitar, and this dark, ominous setting seemed to call forth the melody from him. Richards said the entire song came together in his basement. Did you know? The song was the last hurrah for Keith's 1960s maiden. It was just at the end of recording, just as we're tailing off on Gimme Shelter. And I feel this sort of rubbery feeling. Everything's going rubbery. And the neck just fell off. I said, well, thank God it's a fade out, because obviously this song is over. By morning, he had the basic structure and some lyrics sketched out. Mick Jagger later came in to refine and add to the lyrics, creating the version of Gimme Shelter we know today. Gimme Shelter, its sense of foreboding, coupled with its reflection of the societal and political upheaval of the time, has made it timeless. Yeah. Keith Richards' contributions to rock and roll have left an indelible mark on the world of guitar playing. Yeah. 
we're rolling back the years to 1971. Can't You Hear Me Knocking is one of the Rolling Stones' iconic tracks, hailing from their 1971 album, Sticky Fingers. The song is recognized for its legendary riff and extended jam, which takes up more than half of the track's seven-minute runtime. Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones' lead guitarist and the song's primary composer, is known for his distinctive and infectious riffs. Richards had a knack for finding unique guitar hooks that would act as a foundation for their songs. Yeah, you got Though the song's basic riff arrived in a flash to Keith Richards, he squeezes every nuance out of it during the first half. Richards typically used a method of tuning known as open G tuning, which gives the guitar a unique tonality that helped Richards create many of the Rolling Stones' signature riffs. This tuning was a significant element in the creation of the riff for Can't You Hear Me Knocking. The composition of the song reportedly took place during a jam session. Mick Taylor utilized a Brown Gibson ES-345 for the jam's lengthy outro, cutting a gorgeous improvised solo with a refinement that was obviously absent from the Stones' first extended jam. The 11-minute Going Home on 1966's Aftermath. The Stones were known for their improvisational approach to songwriting at times, and this track is a prime example of that. Did you know? After laying down the basic song structure and recording it, the band members stopped playing, But the tape kept rolling. Not realizing this, Mick Taylor continued playing an impromptu guitar solo. The rest of the band gradually joined back in for an extended jam. When they listened to the recording later, they decided to keep the impromptu jam, giving the song its unique structure and highlighting the spontaneous creation of music that was characteristic of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> The story Can't You Hear Me Knocking, a legendary track created in a moment of unplanned musical brilliance. It's a testament to the Rolling Stones' unique and improvisational approach to music. There you have it. What an incredible journey through rock and roll history. Do you agree with our list? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. Remember to subscribe to our channel for more awesome music content. Until next time, and keep on rolling. He don't know if it's right or wrong Maybe he should tell someone He's not sure just what it was Or if it's against the law Something